short of time, so I'm going to move on. Next item of business is a debate on motion 10794 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2018. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak the buttons down? I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, the purpose of today's debate on the Local Government Finance Order is to seek Parliament's approval to the guaranteed allocations of revenue funding to individual local authorities for 1819. It also seeks agreement to the allocation of additional funding for 1718, which has been identified since the 2017 order was approved this time last year. The 1819 budget delivers a fair settlement for local government under the most challenging of circumstances, and the funding package in 2018-19 continues to focus on the delivery of our joint priorities to deliver sustainable economic growth, eh, together with protecting frontline services and the most vulnerable in our society. And in providing a real terms increase in resource funding to local authorities, it will ensure that local authorities have the funding available to follow the lead of the Scottish Government and lift the 1% pay cap. In 1819, the Scottish Government will provide councils with a total funding package worth £10.7 billion. This includes revenue funding of over £9.8 billion and support for capital expenditure of over £876 million. Today's order seeks Parliament's approval for the distribution and payment of £9.5 billion out of a revenue total of £9.8 billion and the remainder will be paid out as specific grant funding or other funding which will be distributed later as agreed with local government. Included in these figures is £159.5 million which I announced on the 31st of January during the debate on stage one of the 1819 budget bill. The remaining £10.5 billion I announced will be paid as a specific revenue grant in support uh, of, uh, sorry, I'll say that again. The remaining £10.5 million I announced will be paid as specific revenue grant in support of internal ferries for the Northern Isles. If I had announced £10 billion for ferries for the Northern Isles, that might have been a wholly uh, different uh, matter. <laughs> but of this uh, extra £159.5 uh, million, £125 million was allocated as an amendment to the Budget Bill at Stage 2 and is included in the 1819 Revenue Support Grant figures in the order that is set out at Stage 1 debate. The remaining £34.5 million is included as a redetermination uh, of that revenue support grant figures which is within today's order. I hope you got all of that. The overall funding package for 1819 includes an additional £159.5 million to protect spending on day-to-day -day services as announced on 31st of January as part of Stage 1 of the Budget Bill, £10.5 million pounds for Orkney and Shetland Island councils to support internal ferries for the Northern Isles, 66 million pounds to support additional investment in social care in recognition of a range of pressures that local authorities are facing and 52.2 million pounds of revenue and 150 million pounds of capital funding to deliver on our ambitious programme for the expansion of early years education and childcare. James Kelly. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. The Cabinet Secretary talks about uh, a pa package which is intended to protect council funding uh, and services. Uh, can you then explain why in his own council area of Renfrew they're looking at £24 million of cuts over the next three years and two, 200 job losses as outlined in yesterday's article in the Times? Cabinet Secretary. So, Remshire Council, like many councils, like all councils, in fact, will be making uh, priorities and decisions. At the same time, they're investing more in roads and the environment. They're expanding services, as are many other councils. So it's choices for local authorities. And if you take Remshire Council, for example, they're committed to no compulsory redundancies. So as an example of councils making choices, but my argument back would be that local authorities are well resourced as a consequence of the budget. And the above inflation uplift was good news for local government. Uh, across the land. Uh, there's a range of elements of the package that I've begun to uh, discuss, such as a financial support of £24 million to cover the full year cost of the Teachers Pay Award for 1718, £120 million for the Pupil Equity Funding, spent at the discretion of head teachers, of course, to raise attainment and close the attainment gap, £88 million to maintain the pupil-teacher ratio nationally at 2016 levels, and of course, within health and social care, the 300 
uh, £55 million pounds transfer from the NHS to integration authorities in support of health and social care, uh, which has been baselined. And of course, if all local authorities, and it looks as if they, they all look set to increase uh, council tax by up to 3%, that's worth an additional £77 million pounds to Scotland's local authorities. 30 local authorities have set their council tax uh, levels with the remainder to do so uh, this week. So that does represent a real terms increase uh, for uh, local government. Now, there remains a further £47.6 million pounds of revenue funding that will be distributed once the necessary information becomes available and will be included uh, for approval in the 2019 order. And the amounts involved as agreed with local government are as follows. That's £37.6 million pounds in respect of the teachers' induction scheme and £10 million, pounds, which is the balance of the total sum available to ensure the impact of the bedroom tax can be fully mitigated. In addition to the revenue funding contained within today's order, the specific revenue funding that is paid directly by the relevant policy under separate legislation eh, amounting to £273.7 million, pounds, including the pupil equity funding, eh, £86.5 million pounds for criminal justice social work, the £52.2 million pounds, eh, for early years expansion, the additional support for the Northern Isles ferries and £4.4 million pounds for Gaelic funding. Now, the 2018 order also seeks approval for changes to funding allocations for 1718 of £148.6 million, pounds, eh, which has been added to fund a number of agreed spending commitments. And they include £42.3 million pounds for the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, £37.5 million pounds to support the Teacher Induction Scheme, and £22.5 million pounds for temporary accommodation. Eh, there is certainly a, a strong increase for capital funding as well, primarily supporting the government's uh, efforts around uh, early learning and childcare, further investments that were previously debated uh, also uh, around our ambitious housing targets. Uh, I would argue that our business rates package is amongst the most generous, the most generous uh, in the UK and our specific measures to support growth and the business community has warmly welcomed our decision to cap the uplift at CPI rather than RPI. So in summary, the total funding from the Scottish Government to local government next year amounts to £10.7 billion. These funding proposals continue to deliver a fair financial settlement for our partners in local government, which will be strengthened by continued joint working to improve outcomes for local people by improving educational attainment and through health and social care integration. So, presiding officer, I now move that the Parliament approves the Local Government Finance Scotland Order for 2018. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Now call on Alexander Stewart. Mr Stewart, uh, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We in the Scottish Conservatives have been clear that we do not believe the Scottish Government's funding settlement for our local councils is fair. It falls well short of the revenue increase of £540 million that COSLA have said that local authorities require to maintain current levels. This poor settlement is systematic of the SNP government's approach to local democracy. Unlike us in the Scottish Conservatives, who believe that local authorities can be the real engines of local growth, the Scottish government seems to treat councils with contempt. Uh, and I spent 18 years presiding office as a councillor, and I'm well aware of what governments have done to local government uh, uh, in that timescale. And over the tenure of this government, they have certainly done that. While we maintain that this is extra, I'd like to make some progress. While we maintain that this is exactly uh, and disappointing in a difficult settlement, and we acknowledge that, uh, we shall be voting today uh, with the Scottish Government motion in order to ensure that our local councils receive their funding. Presiding officer, it is clear uh, from the carefully choreographed PR stunt that we saw negotiating between the SNP and the Greens earlier this uh, year that, that they reversed the draft budget proposal and real term cut to local government budgets. But this has gone uh, and by no means far enough. In fact, it, it was very much the case that the Scottish Government could only give uh, the sufficient financial professors to ensure that councils receive their funding. And the financial overview of local government uh, in the, uh, the views of Audit Scotland highlighted that there are real challenges facing local government as we move forward. Rather worryingly, the report revealed that Scottish councils are on average spending 10% of their revenue budget servicing borrowing. The report suggests that some councils could run out of funds completely in the next two to three years. These problems are, are very much at the fault of the Scottish Government. 7.6% of real-time cut in local authorities since 2010-2011. 
Moreover, the pressures that the SNP have put on local authority budgets and forced many councils across Scotland to use fees and charges to fund vital services is totally unacceptable. <laughs> Presiding officer, it is not only the level of funding itself that the Scottish Government has gone badly wrong this year. We have seen incompetence plain sight of incompetence when it emerged that provisional local government settlement, including ring fence funds for criminal justice, had been allocated in two areas of the budget. Local authorities also are facing significant shortfalls when it comes into double counting means that they are, they are facing bigger challenges. Councils have planned their budgets based on the figures set by the Scottish Government's draft budget. And these problems that only created even more difficulties for them. I'll take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I just make sure that the record is absolutely accurate here? There was absolutely no double counting. Uh, the, the consultation phase that comes after the circular allows local authorities to engage and come back to local government if there's a different choice in methodology or other matters. And that's exactly what happened, a different way to allocate the resource. Uh, but I, I, I know that Alexander Stewart would would, first of all, welcome the fact that the Scottish Government consults with local government on distribution and is willing to respond and will not continue what would be totally inaccurate to suggest that there was double counting when there was not. Alexander Stewart. Different way to allocate resource, says it all, Cabinet Secretary. But, Presiding Officer, it is not just the incompetence that, that we've seen. Uh, we have also seen the Scottish Government in recent, recent months deal with the settlement uh, in so many different ways. And there's been a sleight of hand when it's come to the, the percentage that the pay uh, uh, for, for council workers has been dealt with. A 3% pay rise uh, was, was talked about and agreed, and the funding core government staff technically does not cover the 240,000 council workers. Scottish ministers have had to admit that the fact that it creates an expectation that staff and council staff will, would expect a 3% rise, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. Because I have warned that the main challenge for local government finances that they see going forward is Scotland government's public sector pay policy itself, the cost itself. Now, we, we've already heard that if every council uh, put up their rate, that would bring in £77 million. I'd like to make progress. The cost increase to staff for, for a 3% would mean that it would be £210 million, nearly three times the amount, dear presiding officer. The funding that would be required is not there. Presiding officer, it highlights a wider problem within local government financing in Scotland, and that's the lack of transparency by this Scottish Government. The local government finance order today we're voting on, and we have said that we will approve that, but we're uncomfortable about doing that because it means that Parliament cannot properly debate local government financing for 2018-19 in the full knowledge and the impact that will happen. Uh, this today is a purely procedural issue that we're going through. Uh, there is therefore opportunities for us to deal with the financial circular when it comes forward, but we're not going to get that until later on this year and after this debate. Uh, so, as far as I'm concerned, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, as, uh, the Scottish Conservatives will be voting for this motion today, but we do not believe that it is the right way to go forward, and we do not believe it's the proper way to manage the businesses of Scotland's finances. Hardworking Scots up and down the country are being asked by this SNP government to pay more in tax while their local services are being cut. The Scottish Government are, are tackling uh, and, and ensuring that they're giving and taking with one hand and taking with the other. That's a double whammy to people across this country. The Scottish Government urgently needs to rethink their approach to local government finances and make progress on funding allocations to councils. More transparency so that we get the proper parliamentary scrutiny that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Kelly. Five minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate and to oppose the local government finance order being brought forward by well, the De 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 Derek Mackay. As, uh, as just let me finish the <laughs> sentence, please, <laughs> Mr Mackay. Uh, as I was saying, uh, to oppose 
The order brought forward by Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. I'll give way to Mr Mackay. Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate Mr Kelly giving me the intervention after only 14 uh, seconds in. Um, <laughs> it was really just to make the point, as I'm sure that James Kelly knows, that to oppose the order is to oppose the monies actually going to local government. The Tories in this regard have at least reflected we'll have a difference of opinion on the sums, but this is a technical order to release the monies that have been allocated. By all means, campaign for more if the Labour Party wishes, but if you were to be successful, it would mean no money going to local government. James Kelly. The Cabinet Secretary may make the point that this is a, a technical order and a technical debate, but we won't sign up to what in effect is an, an allocation of cuts to local councils. We, we, hear, we hear time and time again speeches from the SNP benches about opposing austerity and standing up for progressive policies. But if you look at what's happening in local government, the figures are absolutely stark. Prior even to this year's budget, we had a cumulative effect of £1.5 billion of cuts. COSLA reckoned that £545 million was needed in order to fill the black hole uh, in the SNP budget. And I, I acknowledge that there, were, there was movement between stage one and stage three, but it still left uh, a stark hole of £386 million. And that is reiterated by the points made in the Audit Commission report in November last year, which gave some stark examples of how councils are struggling uh, to, you know, to fill the gaps after year on year uh, of cuts. Yeah, I certainly will. Minister. President Officer, Mr Kelly is painting, uh, as he points it, uh, to be a stark picture. If things were so stark, why was it that Labour councils last year um, refused to raise the council tax when they had the ability to do so? James Kelly. It was SNP MSPs who have pressed their buttons in this parliament year after year, seven years in a row, allocating, allocating, allocating cuts budgets to local councils. Just look at the analysis in yesterday's Times, which very helpfully went through council area by council area, uh, what, what's actually happening on the ground. And if you just take one example of jobs, Aberdeenshire, 370 jobs going. East Renfrewshire, 300. Renfrew, Mr Mackay's own area, 200. Fife, 190. North Ayrshire, 50. The Scottish Borders, 35. Angus, Salosa, 16 teaching posts. And Orkney, 14. This is just from the Times uh, an analysis alone and that totals just short of 1,200 jobs lost. If, there were, if those were being lost in an industry or a specific factory, the Scottish Government would quite rightly be setting up a task force as a matter of urgency. But instead, we get the Cabinet Secretary coming along here today asking us to vote for an allocation which will cut budgets and cut jobs and cut services. And he tells us in, in, a, in, you know, in, in kind of reasonable tones that it's a well-resourced budget. Again, just look at what's happening across the country. Yesterday in Western Bartonshire, uh, voting for a, a, a budget that resulted in two and a half million pounds of cuts, cuts to, to services like Meals on Wheels. These have a real impact on uh, local services and local communities. And I would also contend that it doesn't, the, 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 the cuts that we're seeing don't help the government achieve their policy objectives. I mean, the government, understandably, will want to see improvements in educational performance. They'll want to see the statistics improve for those, uh, the, for, for those crucial skills of reading, writing uh, and arithmetic. But it's difficult to see how you make that happen uh, if you're taking teaching posts and classroom assistant posts uh, out of schools, as some councils uh, are having, having to do. I'm sorry, I'm nearly, I'm nearly at the end. I've, I have taken two interventions. So, um, and so, so it doesn't join up, and it also doesn't join up with, with growing the economy. If you're draining services uh, from education, and also in some cases, councils have told me that they sometimes have to cut back on business planning and local economy units, you know, which will undermine the ability of the council to contribute to local economic growth. So this doesn't make sense in terms of the government's overall policy priorities. So in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, 
We won't stand in the sidelines and cheer on the cuts like the SNP MSPs. We'll stand up for local communities and we'll oppose this order at five o'clock tonight. Thank you very much. I call Andy Whiteman. Mr Whiteman, four minutes, please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. This is an important debate. I think it's not just a technical one, um, but in many ways I think it's a debate we shouldn't be having. I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, this order, as the Cabinet Secretary says, delivers almost £9.5 in revenue support grant uh, and non-domestic rates for councils across Scotland. And this money will be used to deliver the wide range of vital public services, um, from educating Scotland's young people to environmental health, social care, leisure, recreation, transport, housing. Now, following Green's engagement with the budget process, this settlement represents a real terms, if modest, increase in revenue spending for local government across Scotland. This was a, a key demand in budget negotiations, and I'm pleased that it has been uh, secured. And this is therefore a settlement that we will be voting for uh, at decision time. But as I mentioned at the outset, this is not a settlement we would like to be uh, voting for. Presiding officer, it's fundamentally wrong that so much of the revenue and capital budgets of local government is de determined by the Scottish Parliament. In 2014, COSLA's Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy published its final report in which it argued that, and I quote, the case for much stronger local democracy is founded on the simple premise that it is fundamentally better for decisions about these aspirations to be made by those who are most affected by them. And this is an argument I know that many members will recognize from the 2014 independence debate when largely the same argument was used to advance the case for Scottish independence. But for more than 50 years, local democracy in Scotland has been eroded to the point now where Scotland's one of the least democratic countries in Europe, with the weakest structure of local government and with the least fiscal freedom. Across most, local, uh, across most European countries, at least 50% of the budgets that municipalities and communes raise is raised locally. And that delivers a sense of accountability that's entirely missing in Scotland and where the politicians who make the decisions about raising and spending money are genuinely local. Politicians you would meet on a daily basis in the street, in the shops, in the school playground. Scottish Greens want to see a fundamental shift in political power from Holyrood to local communities. And thus, this is the last budget, the last budget that we will be willing to enter negotiations over unless there is a serious, credible, and substantive process begun to increase fiscal autonomy of local authorities, reform local taxation, shift the balance of funding from the center to the local, and put in place the kind of fiscal framework that exists between the UK and Scotland in relation to devolved budgets. So that's why on the 21st of February, Patrick Harvey wrote to the First Minister to outline why we need local tax reform as envisaged by the Commission on Local Tax Reform. That's why last March, following the budget, we published a paper outlining what a fiscal framework for local government might look like. And that's why I will soon put out for consultation a proposal for a member's bill to incorporate the European Charter on Local Self-Government into Scots law. In particular, presiding officer, it is an affront to local democracy that the limited and regressive tax power they do have the council tax remains the most regressive tax in the United Kingdom, based on a tax base last assessed over a quarter of a century ago. It's wrong that council tax rate, council tax rate setting powers have been appropriated by the finance secretary in a form of Tory rate capping in order to cajole local government to bend to the will of central government and to punish councils if they do not meet the preferences of Scottish ministers. This is a process that would be unlawful across most of Europe and is, in my view, unlawful under international law. Presiding officer, I do not feel comfortable sitting in this parliament and voting on how much money local government should receive. But we are where we are, and we'll be supporting the order at decision time. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Actually, just, I'd like to begin by actually commending Andy Whiteman for the remarks that he's just made about local government finance. I believe, just like this place, should be able to raise the majority of the money that it spends, that local government should have the same power too. Because if you control the purse strings, you can control your own destiny. And then we can have true local democracy rather than the control that we have by central government over local government. So I agree with an awful lot of what Andy Whiteman has just said. I think we should be putting power 
back in the hands of local government, taking back control for them, I think, is incredibly important. Because if we're going to improve local accountability so that local electorate hold their local councillors to account for the decisions that they make, there is no point in central government dictating how much money they're going to get in the first place. So I think, no, not just now, I think that therefore should change. Um, and I hope we get a, a good debate over the next year which will encourage that kind of reform so we can get true local government. Um, I'd like to, to commend my colleagues, uh, Tavish Scott and Liam MacArthur, for achieving even more than they thought um, for the ferries for the Northern Isles. I heard the Finance Secretary commit to £10 billion for new ferries um, for the Northern Isles. These luxury ferries that are going to be providing a bed for every passenger with waiters on tap, I think is a great innovation by the Minister. Cabinet Secretary, briefly. Of déjà vu. If I put in £10 billion on the budget for the ferries, would even Willie Rennie vote for it? Willie he's, Rennie. He's, Willie taken, Rennie. he's taken the words out of my mouth. It would still not be good enough, <laughs> I'm afraid. Because <laughs> the SNP always falls short of what is required. <laughs> um, but the, I think I would like to focus, however, um, on, a, on a serious element of, of this statement today. Because for the, the sixth year in a row, we have the failure of the SNP government. To, to match its commitment from its 2011 manifesto. The manifesto which said, re-elect Alex Salmond. And it said in it, we will introduce a new fun funding floor to ensure that no local authority receives less than 85% of the Scottish average, in, sorry, Scottish average in terms of revenue support. This will be funded by additional money for central government. Now, the spice briefing based on the draft budget, I admit, but having looked at the figures today, the, the percentages have not changed substantially. The Edinburgh figure is not 85%, but 80.7%, and Aberdeen is 81.5%. Well short of the funding floor that was promised. Now, instead of fixing the funding for local government, particularly in Aberdeen, who have suffered a shortfall of getting on to £20 million pounds, um, on average each year for each of those six years. Instead of providing more money for Aberdeen and now Edinburgh, they've just fixed the formula. Because what they now say is it includes council tax income, which miraculously takes the figure right up. Now, that wasn't the commitment back in 2011. It was very... No, I've taken an intervention Mr Rennie's in his last minute. Um, so they are... There is a shortfall again, and the figures this year are £28 million shortfall for Edinburgh, and 7.3 million shortfall for Aberdeen, based on the promise that was made in the 2011 manifesto. So yet again, failing to meet the commitment that they had made to meet that 85% funding floor. So I hope we'll get some kind of revision um, of this to meet their commitments in future. The North East has faced some considerable problems in recent years over oil and gas. The NHS has been underfunded by £16 million a year on average, and the infrastructure for that part of the world is poor too. So it needs to change. It needs to change to meet the commitment, and it needs to change to meet a fair deal for Aberdeen and for Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. I call John Mason to follow by Graeme Simpson. Four minutes speeches, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm always happy to speak on the budget and once again tell the Tories why they are wrong. Although the focus today is on local government finance, clearly we also need to look at the wider issues of how we raise revenue and how we spend it. I suspect most people today will argue that local government should get more money rather than less, although of course the Conservative policy of cutting or freezing tax would mean that either local government or other sectors would have their funding cut. So firstly, I think we should acknowledge the Green Party pushing on this and agreeing with the government to raise income tax a bit more and so fund our councils a bit better. But there is only so far you can go down that route without killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Labour have suggested much higher taxation, but apparently without doing much research, exploring how it would work in practice, or having their figures independently checked. It is interesting that a party that supported having the Scottish Fiscal Commission independent and doing the forecasts instead of the SNP government is not quite so keen on having its own forecasts properly verified. So assuming that we do not have much scope for raising the tax take much more at this stage, presumably the other parties 
wanting to give more to local authorities, want to take that money off other sectors, like the health service. Uh, if, uh, Mr Whiteman. I thank Mr Whiteman for taking the intervention. Surely the point is that it's not so much whether we should raise more tax to give to local government, it's a question of whether local government should have the fiscal levers to decide for itself how much revenue it wishes to raise in its local area. John Mason. I mean, I do basically agree with his argument and what he said in his speech today. I look forward to his uh, bill coming. But I think where we are today for 1819, and this is what Labour have failed on, is they couldn't introduce ta new taxes in time for uh, this April. Uh, we find it difficult to get some of the other parties to admit this, but more money for local government means either fewer nurses, fewer doctors, fewer medicines, fewer students, uh, fewer trains, or one of these other options. The Tory suggestion of making savings through less wastage is just another way of making cuts. And they have not told us what departments they think should be getting these cuts. Is it local government or is it somewhere else? Now, obviously, as a Glasgow MSP, I want as much funding as possible for our city. I consider that funding allocations must be based on need and not on arbitrary per percentages, eh, as Willie Rennie seems to suggest. Eh, I do accept that need can be hard to measure, but our allocations to local government must be based on need. The top four local authorities by funding in the provisional figures are the three island authorities, followed by Argyll and Butte, also with many islands. Having been heavily involved in the islands bill, eh, I do think that is appropriate based on the extra costs and challenges the islands face. The next three on the per capita basis are Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire and Glasgow. And I think most people would feel that was appropriate based on the needs which these local authorities face. And compared to England, local councils are getting a good deal. This week is Apprenticeship Week, and yesterday I visited an organisation in my constituency which provides care for adults with learning disabilities and others with quite severe needs. It was good to hear they put a huge emphasis on training, not just for apprentices, but for all their staff. But it was especially encouraging to hear too that they are able to pay their workers in Scotland one pound per hour more than they, have, they can do so in England. And that is because local authorities here are willing and able to pay that bit more. And that in turn is because local authorities in Scotland are better funded than their counterparts down south. So of course we would all like more money for almost everything, but we have to live in the real world and that means living within our means. Maybe in future years that means more taxation, Maybe in future years, other sectors will need less money. But I have to say that for 2018-19, I think we have set a pretty reasonable and fair budget, and in particular, a pretty reasonable and fair settlement for local government. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you. Uh, last year, I stood here and bemoaned a finance settlement that left councils making cuts, axing services and losing staff. And here we are again. £15 million, pounds, a lot of money. Remember that figure, because I'll return to it. Scottish Conservatives will vote for the order tonight because councils need the money. But as Alexander Stewart has already said, our support should not be seen as acceptance that it's a fair settlement, because it isn't. Local government has been squeezed year after year by the SNP. However, they try to dress it up or even hide the true picture Councils have been making cuts every year under Derek Mackay and John Swinney. Mr Mackay was once a promising young council leader who stood up for local government. Now he cuts a figure from a Dickens novel. First, 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 you cut a figure from a Dickens novel. First, here's Mr Micawber presenting a draft budget hoping something will turn up which it surely does in the shape of Patrick Harvey. But at the same time, he's Mr. Scrooge, swinging the axe on local government, a complex man indeed. Now, I was a councillor for 10 years, and every year the SNP have been in power, we had to make decisions on what to cut. The council tax freeze was there, so at least that was something, but we held our nerve when that ended and continued it because that's what we had pledged to do. Keeping our promises on tax, what a novel concept. <laughs> this year, the current crop of councillors were set up to expect a massive cut in their budget. So when that cut was not quite as bad as they first feared, some of the more naive among them were delighted. We've even had the rookie SNP 
Council Leader John Ross drooling that it was, quote, the most progressive budget for South Lanarkshire Council for many years and praising a better than expected settlement. Now, Derek Mackay and his outrider, Mr. Harvey, may be able to fool the likes of Councillor Ross, but his council has still had to make 15 million pounds of cuts. There's that 15 million. And is losing more than 100 full-time equivalent members of staff. On top of that, hard-pressed council taxpayers in South Lanarkshire can now look forward to a 3% increase in what they give the council to manage potholes. I can't wait. If that's progressive, then you can keep it. South Lanarkshire is no different to any other council. What about Labour-run North Lanarkshire? Their challenge was slightly easier, but they still had to make £2.6 million pounds of cuts and lose more than 50 full-time equivalent staff. And there's that familiar council tax increase. At least the council leader, Jim Logue, knew who to blame this time, noting the devastating impact that the continued level of austerity enacted, enacted by the Scottish Government's lack of support for local government. Well, that just about sums it up. The Scottish people are starting to realise the consequences of the SNP's incompetence on the service delivery of local government. Derek Mackay and Patrick Harvey's annual charade may con SNP council leaders, but not everyone is as easily fooled. We can expect the same dance next year. Now, council staff throughout Scotland could be forgiven for expecting a 3% pay rise. Mm -hmm. Well, the bad news is mm -hmm. the Scottish Government, having created that expectation, won't pay for it. Mm -hmm. Fair funding, presiding officer? I don't think so. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by James Dornan. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The budget debate this year has been marked, uh, as it has in previous years, by contorted rhetoric and even more contorted mathematics to try to claim largesse and generosity when it comes to the settlement for local government. Frankly, that's nothing short of a, of a cruel irony, because after 10 years of uh, uh, SNP government, local government has seen 10 years of austerity passed on to it. £1.5 billion worth of cuts. And let's be clear, this is an SNP choice. Since 1314, uh, the Scottish Government saw a cut of 1.5% to its revenue grant, and yet it passed on a cut of 4.5% in revenue funding to local government. And, and this is um, despite the fact that much of the SNP's largest public policy uh, 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 change proposals actually require the use of local government, whether it's the expansion of childcare or tackling the attainment gap. The reality is, is that while the SNP increasingly adds to the job list of local government, they give less and less to them in order to do it. I'll give way. James Dornan. Outside of local government, the, the biggest funder, the receiver of funds, is the NHS. Could you tell me just how much you would have taken out the NHS budget to fill that gap that you claim is there? Daniel Johnson. The reality is, is the SNP have failed to use the powers of this place year after year. That's where you, you fill the gap, through progressive taxation. But, the, but let's... Let, I'll give way. Uh, Mr Minister? Johnson is talking about filling gaps, uh, presiding officer. Maybe you can tell us why Labour councils chose not uh, to increase the council tax last year, uh, which would have filled a few gaps, as he would put it. Just, just a wee minute. Uh, you, you stand up when I call you. I know you're desperate to reply. Well, to Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. But the, the reality is, is the council tax is a regressive form of taxation. The SNP used to think that. Why don't they think that anymore? But the reality is this is also a rather odd debate. And I'd firstly like to echo some of the comments made by Andy Whiteman. We have to make... Uh, local government fiscally responsible again but also we need a transparent budget process because while we might have debated the budget two weeks ago we still don't have the clear and final detail according to SPICE at the point that I entered the chamber we still didn't have the local government financial circular and that I think is a disturbing lack of transparency and I would urge the minister to reflect upon that in future years that we have an improved more transparent budget process, and indeed a more stable form of funding local government. But let me turn my comments to Edinburgh, and I would like to thank Willie Rennie for raising the issue of Edinburgh. It's uh, very generous for him to speak up of, for areas other than his own. But the reality is this is a terrible 
deal for Edinburgh. This year we'll see a £2.6 million real terms cut according to the latest figures that we have seen. And indeed that comes off the back of a budget settlement less last year which was described by the uh, council leader in Edinburgh as the worst settlement since devolution. Now Edinburgh has much of what we need for, for it to be successful. We have a, a high number of tech startups, we have universities, a high number of graduates. But there's a reality to this. First of all, to make good on those uh, success factors, you need investment. But also, that, uh, factors such as those can hide the underlying poverty that we see in Edinburgh. And in the 10 years of declining budgets at Edinburgh, see, we have seen real impacts in the vital services that some of the most uh, poorest people in our communities need in order to uh, 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 get by. We've seen cuts in terms of growing class sizes, fewer teachers. Uh, we also see increasingly those teachers uh, teaching in older schools, and I'd like to raise again the case of Liberton. I have four high schools in, in, in my constituency, and Liberton was, was uh, uh, built in the 1950s and has barely seen investment since. Edinburgh is the second to last in terms of funding per head behind Aberdeen and has consistently seen twice the level of cuts compared to the Scottish average. And indeed, it's seen a 10% cut in its funding since 1314. That's 150 pounds per person. And on that note, I will finish my comments and, and, and just uh, uh, agree with my colleague, James Kelly, that we cannot support this budget settlement because it just frankly shortchanges local government. Thank and the vital you. Services I they call provide. James Dornan, please. You're the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There's no question the government is being pushed into making never more difficult choices when it does come to public spending and finance. There's also no doubt that we would like to be given more to local authorities. But let's not pretend here that the block grant isn't being cut, which obviously has a, 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 an impact on day-to-day -day spending uh, decreasing across the board. Uh, 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 yes, of course, about Daniel. Daniel Johnson. In my comments, has been cut by 1.5%. So why is the Scottish Government cut by 4.5% in the same period? James Dornan. I think I, I, I already touched on that answer when I, I asked for an intervention and you refuse to answer it. Obviously, we have made a priority of, make, of spending in the NHS. We've protected local authorities as much as we possibly can, given the financial settlement we're getting from them. And what I don't see is where the money is coming from for any of these fantasy projects that you keep on bringing forward. You have to say, if, if you're bringing forward a, a, something, you have to say how you're going to pay for it. And from nobody in this chamber have I seen anybody that does that. I see, I mean, over the next two years, the figure is going to fall by over £500 million. And, President Officer, when I was a councillor at Glasgow City Council and council uh, group leader for a while, and for the years after as a Glasgow MSP, all I heard from the Labour-led administration was cries over and over again for the council tax to be unfrozen. Freezing the council tax for families across Scotland was a progressive policy and it benefited households across the country. But as everybody in here knows, I'm a reasonable man. And I can understand that needs change. The Scottish Government did indeed unfreeze this tax and councils have the option of raising the council tax by up to 3%, a total of £77 million. But what puzzles me is the unwillingness of many of the Labour-led administrations to grab this opportunity with both hands. Something they asked for and something they refused to use. Now, for example, last year, Labour and North Lanarkshire cut posts. They protested outside this parliament and made claims that the SNP were responsible for these staff losses. And yet this year, they refused to increase council tax, even for the richest households, to any extent which would allow them to save any of these staff members. Now, call me cynical but it was a local authority election last year, and I do have to wonder if votes were more important to that administration than actually protecting these services and workers. This year, the same council and many other Labour-led administrations are still making cuts to jobs, quite often backed up by Tory votes in the chamber, and including classroom assistance, which was mentioned by James Kelly earlier on in his contribution. But it doesn't need to be like that. Compare these councils to the excellent local budgets of other run SNP-run administrations, in my city of Glasgow, the local authority have agreed on one of the most progressive budgets in a long time. Taking Cordia back into the local authority has been something I've been passionate about for a long time because this service will clearly work better if it has a close partnership between the social work department and the same local authority. Investment in city infrastructure, a commitment to fixed roads and pavements and lighting, that's what the public want. They want to see a commitment to improvement of everyday lives and that's what's happening in Glasgow. As convener of education, I've also got to congratulate councillors like South Lanarkshire, 
who found ways to up the uniform grant to allow children to attend school with the very basics required to learn and to feel like they belong. Glasgow City Council, again, are also planning to tackle child hunger by offering free school meals during the holiday period. These kind of policies will change the lives of children and young people across the area. And as we strive for a fairer Scotland, we should all be welcoming that. President officer, I'd like to finish by saying that as a former councillor, I do understand there are frustrations around finance. But we must recognise this government has been ever more financially restricted by Westminster. And we need to protect services such as the NHS. We still have to find a way to benefit, which benefits the people of local authorities across Scotland. And I would suggest a pay rise for public sector workers, a new progressive tax system, and excellent budgets being delivered by some of our big, biggest councils are the way to do it until such times as we're an independent country, of course, and to make sure that we not only survive, but thrive in these tough economic times. I support the government. And thank you. Can I uh, say gently to the member, I don't like the term them. I prefer to hear the opposition or the other government, but not the term them. Uh, I now move to closing speeches. I call James Kelly to close for Labour. Mr Kelly, four minutes, please. OK. Um, uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think there's been a number of interesting points uh, raised in the, the debate. Uh, I was interested in Al Alexander Stewart's contribution and his stout defence of local government and his view that the Tories supported a fair funding settlement for local government. Uh, uh, I would certainly agree with that. However, I would say that, you know, during the course of the, the budget process, it seemed to me that the Tories put forward a view um, which, where they wanted to keep taxes as low as possible and they didn't actually have any solutions in terms of how they would actually fund local government. So I'm not sure that the, the, the rhetoric from Mr Stewart backed up the reality from the, the Tories during the budget process. There may be, uh, I know there are, there, uh, there are people on the other bench who disagreed with Labour's approach to the budget, but at least we did set out what our views were. We set out what an alternative budget was in terms of how much money uh, we sought to raise and how we thought, thought that should be spent. Uh, the Tories didn't uh, go through that exercise. Uh, in terms of pay, which has come up from a, a number of members during the debate, uh, I do think it's unfortunate that although uh, in relation to local government, uh, the the, the Cabinet Secretary does not obviously have direct responsibility in relation to pay. He's made a number of announcements of policy intent on pay policy and therefore there'll be an expectation, quite rightly, from council workers that they uh, should receive at least the terms of the pay policy that the Cabinet Secretary's announced. Um, but the reality is that throughout the process, it was £200 million short at the start. Uh, there was no additional money brought forward for pay. And that puts councils in a position where, you know, they have to choose between, get, given that fair, uh, that fair pay settlement, cutting services and cutting jobs. And that's why we see the extent of the job cuts that I, I touched on in my introductory contribution. And I didn't include the, the 100 jobs that Graham Simpson highlighted from South Lanarkshire Council. That takes it up to to 1,300, and I think that shows the, the scale of the problem. I think some people in their, their contributions looked at, you know, how we improve the process going forward. Um, I think Daniel Johnson is right to talk about transparency, you know, how can we properly debate the allocations when we don't have the, the circular, circular in place. I think from the Cabinet Secretary's point of view, um, it would be useful if we had more, more information available on what underspends uh, are being recorded throughout the financial year, because clearly that has become a part of the budget process and that each year he digs into the underspend in order to fund the, the, the deal with the Greens. Uh, though I, don't, I did know Andy Whiteman's strong contribution where he made it clear that uh, local government needed to be more of a priority next year, not just in terms of funding, but also in relation to uh, local democracy. And I, I, you know, I think that's very important. I think fundamentally, we, need a, a, we do need a different approach in terms of uh, a local government. Local government has been uh, penalised uh, year on year. Uh, if we want to change that in terms of next year's debate, we do need to look at progressive taxation and we need to look at how we redistribute more power 
and more service to the local government. Otherwise, local councils will, be continued, will continue to be penalised and it's on that, the basis of that, the penalties that are taking place that we will oppose the, the motion at five o'clock tonight. Thank you very much. I call on Jamie Green to pose for the Conservatives. Five minutes, Mr Green, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Daniel Johnson said in his comments that this is an odd debate, and he is right, because the Scottish Government purportedly reports to seek to improve education and outcomes, protect public services, and support job creation and growth in Scotland. But its local funding policies have exactly the opposite effect. Uh, Mr Dorn, in his remarks, said this is a progressive settlement. Well, I say far from it, because it is local councils and their communities that will be hardest hit by the SNP's choices in this budget. I've just started, let me make some progress. Uh, now, many members have talked about uh, job losses in their own local council area. Uh, closer to home in Inverclyde, the local council has put forward quite viable proposals for cutting 60 council jobs. Now, 60 jobs is a lot and a huge loss to that part of the world. And that's happening right across Scotland. They're also looking at closing community centres and a whole other uh, bunch of services. I spent most of my Monday uh, this week dealing with a case in Inverclyde whereby uh, the constituent has very limited access to a number of services that were previously available for those suffering from the blight of addiction. A number of those services tackling some of Scotland's most deep-rooted problems have been cut in recent years. Now, the Cabinet Secretary can stand there and talk about real terms this and cash terms that, but when we go back to our, when we go back to our constituencies, if I, could, if, I could, if I could finish, if we are the ones that have to go back to our constituencies and deal with the fallout of these local authority fundings. The Cabinet Secretary says that local councils are making choices. They are, but I can assure members that they're making choices they do not want to make. Uh, in other, uh, I will on that. Cabinet Secretary. Thank Green for taking the intervention. Uh, there's the local and then there's the national. If Jamie Green was Finance Secretary and he had to approve the order today, by what sum would Jamie Green increase that order and where would he find him, uh, the resources from to do so? Jamie Green. Uh, unfortunately, Jamie Green has not been the Finance Secretary for the last 10 years because I would have grown the Scottish economy at the same rate as the rest of the UK, which this Cabinet Secretary has quite simply failed to do. And I hope that answers his question. And I look forward to uh, dealing with that next time. So uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary should listen. He does make an important point. He does make an important point. Councils are making difficult choices and they're cutting uh, vital local services that are affecting people in our communities. Uh, there's also a point being made around transparency in this whole process. Um, you know, uh, these benches will vote for the motion today on the technical reason that we have to see local councils get funding. But it is disappointing that this parliament is not privy to the updated financial circular that accompanies the order today. We've been asked to vote on key budget information without first seeing it. Yet local SNP members are putting out press releases with specific numbers on their local council settlements. Now, I would hate to think that they know more about what their council is getting before SPICE or before this parliament and this chamber. But we don't need to know the exact figure for each local authority. We know that allocated funding is going to be a challenge for many. Now, to the unsuspecting eye, uh, the £170 million additional settlement may seem promising at first glance, but the reality is that this settlement nowhere near covers the £545 million that COSLA says that local government needs just to maintain current levels of service, notwithstanding any additional increase in uh, services that it has to provide. Now, at this point, I'd like to refer to the public sector pay rise uh, proposal. Now, we in these benches have been positive about the need to increase income uh, for the public sector. But the question remains, who will pay for these increases? COSLA has said that a 1% pay rise will cost around £70 million. A 3% increase would require around £140 million of expenditure. Now, the SNP have left local authorities to foot the bill for their proposed promise of public sector pay rises. And the idea that council tax increases is this great panacea of local government says two things. It says that council taxpayers should foot the bill for stagnating investment in local authorities, not central government. And it ignores the fact that any proposed increase, uh, as we know pretty much every council in Scotland will, will not even scratch the surface 
of the shortfall that most will face over the next few years. It is this government's poor economic strategies that have left hard-working hard Scots facing increased taxes whilst their local services are being cut. This funding will not lead to more reliable, well-funded public services from local councils. Council tax payers across the length and breadth of Scotland will be paying more and will be getting less and ask the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on that. Thank you very much. I call on the Cabinet Secretary to close for the Government. Cabinet Secretary, six minutes. Oh, I call on the Minister to wind up the Government. Uh, Minister, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, the 2018 uh, Local Government finance, finance Order before us today is seeking parliamentary approval to the guaranteed payment of £9.5 billion in revenue support to be paid to Scotland's 32 local authorities to enable them to provide the people of Scotland with the full range of services they need and fully deserve. Scotland's local authorities will continue uh, to play a pivotal role uh, in the Scottish Government's transformative programme of public service reform as we continue to build on the priorities in the 2017 programme for government and focus on delivery of our joint priorities. Uh, before I get into the detail of today's order, uh, and respond to some of the comments that have been made. Um, I'd like to thank everyone involved in minimising the disruption uh, and inconvenience caused by the extreme weather we experienced last week, uh, many of whom are employed by our local authorities, the length and breadth of Scotland. As you will know, President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution acted immediately he was asked, uh, when he was asked by the Scottish Borders Council to trigger the Bellwyn scheme, which can provide emergency financial assistance. By triggering the scheme, that means that any council can submit a request for additional funding under certain circumstances. And I can confirm that we have also been contacted by Dumfries and Galloway, Perth and Kinross, Aberdeenshire and Angus councils. Um, if I could turn to the matters at hand, uh, presiding officer, uh, we have heard some interesting comments uh, from members um, today. Uh, and if I may start uh, with uh, uh, some of the comments made by uh, Mr. Stewart in, in uh, his opening remarks, uh, where he failed uh, to tell the chamber where um, the Conservatives would find uh, additional monies to give to local government, uh, especially uh, from a party, as Mr Kelly pointed out, that wanted to rip £500 million from the Scottish bu uh, budget. Very interesting uh, to hear uh, what he has to say uh, around about that, if he's got any comment uh, about where they'd find the money from. No, I thought not. Um, but Mr Stewart also talked and scaremongered a lot about other uh, things in, in his remarks. Um, he said that councils may uh, run out of money in the future. Uh, well, for the, the Chamber's uh, knowledge, uh, uh, per, uh, presiding officer, as at 31st of March 2017, local authorities' usable res reserves amounted to £1.9 billion, which represents 18% of the total funding provided by councils, uh, to councils by the Scottish Government. £1.9 billion. Pounds. I'll take an, an intervention from the economic wizard that is Jamie Green. Mr Green. Uh, it's nice to receive a compliment from the centre benches for a change, but does the minister not accept that local government debt is actually reaching nearly £17 billion? Pounds? The idea they're sitting in huge swaths of cash is simply unrealistic and bonkers in my view. Minister. Um, Mr. Green doesn't know the difference between a compliment and sarcasm, obviously, <laughs> presiding officer. Um, £1.9 billion, 18% uh, of the money that goes from government to councils. That is not an insubstantial sum. It is not up to uh, central government to tell local government how they should spend uh, resource uh, in terms of capital spend. What I would say is that a huge amount of money that is being paid out is being paid out in PPP charges, a scheme which would never have been allowed by this government uh, and which has been stopped. And I think others in the chamber should re reflect on some of that. If we turn to pay, I'll, I'll, I'll take you in, in a little while, Mr. Rennie, because I've got some things to say about you too. Um, uh, Presiding officer, if we can turn to pay, um, inflationary pressures on councils include pay. 
uh, which makes up an average 60% of council revenue budgets. Uh, it's therefore wrong, as members have today, to claim councils need a real terms increase in overall funding, plus additional money for pay to keep pace with inflation. That is wrong. We are providing local authorities with a funding increase of £174.9 million in the 2018-19 budget. This includes £24 million as our contribution to increase uh, in teachers' pay for 2017-18. And taken together uh, with the £77 million that can be raised through the council tax, councils will have access to an additional £252 million in revenue funding. That is a 2.6% increase in cash terms and a real terms increase of 1.1%. The additional costs COSLA estimate councils will face as a result, as a result of 2018-19 pay policy is around £220 million. So they have the money to increase pay. Um, and Mr Kelly uh, was right for once in terms uh, of what he said in his summing up. The, King, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance does not have local uh, locus when it comes to local government pay. That is entirely a matter for local authorities um, themselves. President officer, I want to get one point in uh, in response to Mr Rennie, as I said um, that I would. Um, because this uh, order always gives me the opportunity uh, to pay tribute uh, to the late and great Brian Adam, uh, the man who suggested uh, the funding floor which this government implemented. A funding floor which did not exist under previous Labour Liberal ex uh, administrations, which provided a fairer settlement uh, for the likes of Aberdeen uh, and Edinburgh. And if I can finish on this, you uh, must finish. Officer, you must uh, finish. what we see in Aberdeen is £3.9 million more in 2018 19, an, addi an additional £8.7 million because of that floor. And I pray, pay tribute to Brian Adam for that achievement, which was never achieved under previous administrations. Thank you. Presiding officer, I urge members to support the order that, today. Uh, that concludes the debate. Thank you. That concludes the debate on local government finance, Scotland Order 2018. And we now move on to the next item of business. I'll pause for a few minutes.